But you know the, now the, the, the connection here. I'm, I'm closer to the to the to the microphone. Well, we don't see you anymore. That's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> You moved into your new house yet? Yes, we are here in uh, in, in Lausanne now since um, uh, uh, six, actually now two months, two months time. A good start in Lausanne. Long live Lausanne, you know. Uh, Caesar also passed by at Lausanne, what I heard. So, uh... <laughs> oh, really? That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I was asking because I think one of my fondest memories was um, when I went to go pick up my uh, 201 from you. And then we actually had a celebration afterwards. You were living in Geneva at the time, and I think uh, you, your wife, I think your mom also, and then Martin and my and, and myself, uh, we went to the rooftop and we had a fondue on top of there. Yeah, it was a nice, right. a nice place upstairs on the on the rooftop. That's it yeah. that was a legendary place there. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The fountain. Absolutely, it was uh, over, overlooking the whole uh, Geneva Lake, and uh, and actually, I absolutely love this place uh, in, in Geneva, but. Then we had uh, two baby girls coming and this apartment became too small. So we had to move on in a house a little bit outside of Geneva. And, uh, but I always regretted to have left this incredible cool apartment, this penthouse apartment. And actually now we get back, we got back a kind of this style of apartment here in Lausanne. So it's, uh, it's kind of a revival here in uh, Lausanne. What, we, what I started with Isabel, like uh, 15, 15, 16 years ago in this uh, incredible cool apartment in Geneva. And now we are, we are happy here installed in Lausanne. That's fantastic. I think it's in particular in moments like this when we're all sort of like self-isolating and we're in our homes and we're meant to stay in, that you start to have um, very fond memories of moments like that. And I think that was one of my favorite moments as well because it was, it was so fun to do a fondue up, upstairs on the roof overlooking Geneva. And uh, I really can't wait for this period to be over so we can do things like this again, you know? Absolutely. No, it's true. Yeah. One, one really values uh, these moments more. It's, it's time for introspection to a certain degree. You can, you can uh, you know, look at all your, your uh, pictures on, a, on the phone. You can, <laughs> you can yeah. think about, uh, you know, memories uh, and so on. Uh, it's, it's in this sense, it has, a, uh, it has a positive sides too, uh, this, the, the whole situation here. Sure. You know, one of the things that was very interesting was um, I just recently had a conversation with uh, Jean-Claude Biver um, about what the future of the watch industry will be after the, um, the coronavirus um, situation. And he said something quite interesting to me. He said that actually, even though we're in the new millennium, we're still behaving as we did in the 20th century because the leaders of the biggest businesses in the world are still leaders that are, are, are from the 20th century. And I think that one of the primary philosophies of the 20th century was um, capitalism chasing maximum profit, you know? And I mm -hmm. think that we have seen that the result of capitalism chasing maximum profit with no regard for human beings and no regard for the environment is basically brought us almost to the brink of destruction. And maybe uh, this virus, it, you know, it's a terrible thing and I would never sort of belittle the fact that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are, go are, are gonna die, but, in some ways, it's also a wake-up call, as you say, Martin, for us to really think about how we want to conduct ourselves and how we want to live our lives. And one of the things that I've always respected the most about both of you and about Uwerk was that you, you never wanted to be massive. You never wanted to be big. You never wanted to be a giant. You just wanted to stick to what you do and you wanted to make a certain quantity of watches and no more because there was kind of a balance there. Would you say that's, that's been important for you? You know, um, for sure, uh, it's it's um, it's a culture in in my family. I, I grew up I grew up with a father uh, who is an artisan in restoring old clocks. So it's it's really about the family business. So um, this is my 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 culture. And in the same time, now as you say, I think it's also a nice way to live uh, in, in, in with limited, but concentrated to to real quality in your work and less of profit of, of a big industry. I think this is uh, what is just in my, my nature of my family and what I continue somehow to do. And this is also uh, how I built up work with individual responsible persons, but which are um, more into the details and the artisanal uh, quality of their work than doing volumes and uh, 
and pushing pushing novelties every two months and uh, just bringing out big news. Uh, it's more about the details and the quality. In art, in general, or in art, it's about you know the best possible. So your focus is, uh, you know, if you do something, if you create something, you you want to do it as as good as ever possible. That's so that's that's what makes it art, you know. Normally, you know, if you if you don't care about any other things, <laughs> you know, just just do do it the best you possibly can. Of course, uh, this is not always uh, possible, uh, whether in art nor nor anywhere else, you know. But but at least that's uh, uh, what you strive for. That's that's the goal, you know. You know, I met you guys in 2005. And so it's, it's main, uh, the main thing because you want to have it as an experiment. Sorry? Sorry, I think there was just a, a little bit of a video glitch there. So there was yes. an overlap. No, I totally agree, um, Martin and Felix. And I remember I met you guys in 2005. I met you guys at the, uh, the Harry Winston stand because you were launching Opus 5 um, with our buddy Max Buser. And what was interesting was at, in 2005 when I first saw the 103.03, it was to me like it was my world had my perception of, of, of watches of horology completely shifted because it, for the first time I saw a watch where the, the entire language of timekeeping had, had been transmitted into something really poetic and, and futuristic, you know. And then it was an interesting question, I suppose, in terms of 15 years later, when you look at a watch like a 103.03, .03, how do you feel about it? And I think that this is the thing that separates um, true watchmaking art, which needs to have a uh, real horological substance, but then also needs to have a really brave design combined than watches that kind of follow the fashion. Because there are certain watches that were made of that era that today you look at them and you're like, yeah, they look really maybe a bit dated, you know, in the same way that fashion becomes dated. Mm -hmm. But when I look at 103.03 .03, in any of the different variations, including the, the black one that Ralph Lauren is wearing, which I, <laughs> I asked to him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, That's right. The it still looks as cool and as captivating as it is the first moment. So maybe, you know, I think that we could talk about a little bit about this because I think that what Ulrich does is a very beautiful and perfect balance between something that has a real horological purpose, but at the same and certainly, especially if you talk about things like AMC, um, and but also has a very brave design. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is extremely important. But, uh, you know, you, you, of course, hope that maybe, uh, uh, maybe also you don't think about this at the time, but you, do, you, you could hope that, uh, that your creations become, uh, you know, last, you know, that they become something relevant uh, and still maybe even talk about the times they were made in at some point. So the way to do this is to, to take in inspiration from, from what surrounds you at the very moment. And that's something very unique. You can only do that at the very time you do it. You can't do it uh, in another time. You have to do it in the present. So you, you take in as much as possible that, that is happening at the time. And you feel that in, in your creations. And that uh, you know, can maybe then comment about what, what the time was that, you're, that you were doing it in. So it can be something uh, that uh, belongs to the time it was made in. So, way you know, um, <laughs> as, as I told before, when I grew up, I oh, I was around the father, centered around old clocks. Then I joined uh, the watchmaking school. I joined the watch academy. So I I had a lot of friends, also personal friends, watchmakers. So always surrounded about around these watchmakers, and I met really brilliant uh, watchmakers uh, now uh, some of them are in the academy some some are not uh, but there are a lot of brilliant watchmakers around but as you said before somehow actually i realized also very early that there is a lot of shitty design around these watchmakers yes. Yes. that's that's the, the the sad thing actually they do brilliant watchmaking but they they are not designers or creators of forms. They are more designers and creators of mechanisms and constructions. And um, I, I understood that quite early that you need to respect both values to, to get a finalized important piece done. And there are probably only very few uh, watch and clock makers in the past who were able 
to combine both. <clears throat> to be a Leonardo da Vinci in, in watchmaking is very, very rare. I can see that probably at the, at the Ferdinand Bertou, at the Abraham Louis Brugge, some English clockmakers. Um, but individual uh, watchmakers, um, there are not a long, a long, a lot actually, which which are able to express themselves how they do it in a mechanical way, but they are not able to do it in, a, in the form, in the, in the aesthetic. Mm. And this is why, for sure, it was very important to me to to come closer to to my cousin Christoph, and and then through Christoph, my my contemporary art cousin, uh, to to for sure to Martin, which loves watches. And he is is really uh, was very interested into watches since the very beginning. We met like twenty twenty five years ago. And so that that helped a lot to 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 bring actually my ideas, uh, my my mechanical ideas into forms and into something which is speaking at the end. Mm. Uh, it's for instance, please. Uh, I just wanted to add, you know, if you're creating uh, watches, you can when you, when you do that with uh, with an artist's background, you, you look at uh, first, you know, you 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 analyze what is it, what what is it, you know, and what does it. Uh, so, so it's a machine. What is a machine? So you have a, a set of questions, and with your creations, you can also answer those questions. You know, you can, you can, and that makes it interesting. It keeps it interesting. Um, the relationship between a human being and and the machine. That's that's, for instance, a very interesting theme. And we uh, we follow along these uh, these lines, answering questions. You know, about these themes as well. So, so every creation uh, we work watch. Um, gives you the, 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 the latest about our, uh, you know, experiments and our questions regarding what is a machine <laughs> and okay. what is the relationship between the machine and the human being. And especially in our times, we realize that more and more that uh, creating machines uh, uh, is something, of course, that we are proud of. That's why we carry watches, among other reasons. But um, it is also something that... Uh, that bears uh, problems, you know, that uh, the, the, the machine world that is yes. threatening us, the robots, you know what I'm saying? So, so you have a, quite a few themes, and that's just one that uh, are interesting to, to, to think about. And so it's the, the whole thing, it's a very uh, uh, interesting endeavor and, and an experiment, as I say. So you want to answer questions with what you're doing, and that's, that's uh, what makes it interesting and why you do it. I think one of the things that I find most striking about Uber watches, um, and it's, it's also, it, it follows what you were saying, Martin. Today, we have a sense, you know, that we are constantly being chased by time. Uh, certainly, you know, before um, the outbreak of, you know, COVID-19, we were moving constantly. We were going from one meeting to the next, one phone call to the next. Um, and the thing that I loved about Uber watches was not just that the design was beautiful, which it was, not just that the, the, the movement or the watchmaking was incredibly innovative, which it is, but I love that the um, emotional uh, experience of reading the time on an Uber watch was one that made you feel calm, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, though it's interesting, just the transformation from taking hands and transforming it into, well, it's not easy, it's a challenging, which, which you achieved, a, a three-dimensional hour indicator and then this sort of dragging minutes indicator. When you watch time in this way, there is a moment, a feeling that time, you know, in some ways is, is for you to enjoy rather than for it to impose itself upon you. Was that mm -hmm. something that you guys had intended to achieve? So quickly, Wei, the history of, of the wandering hour um, complication or, or time indication, let's say, um, comes from 1600, actually 1650, now um, where the Campani brothers, clockmakers, and actually also astronomers uh, invented that time indication to, to bring actually time, time indication into the bedroom of the Pope Alexander V. Um, that is quite funny because he wanted to know time by night. But then in the same time, they invented that digital hour, which is wandering hour um, over 90 or 120 degrees. Um, it, it actually shows you, it gives you the possibility to, to bring a, a candle behind this digital. 
digits and so you do have some light during during the night and to be able to read the time but at the same time it slows down your perception of time um, so normally 60 minutes are shown through 360 degrees and we are showing it through 90 or 120 degrees so it's it moves slower and it gives you some breathe somehow and it it it, it tells you don't take actually go more for the for the big picture look into the big picture and not every second somehow mm -hmm. and this this impressed me a lot, actually, this mm -hmm. kind of um, setback. Um, and it, it, it just in, creates some, some reflections in you when you are in, appreciating this time indication, which you don't get with normal hands. And so that, that idea um, I've seen on the bench of, of my father restoring one of these old night clocks. And uh, then further, we brought it further a few years later to Martin, and also he was very attached to that idea. It's a fascinating thing. First of all, uh, reading time is something that we are, we are uh, you know, busy with, you know, from childhood on. It's something that we learn, uh, you know, being a kid. And therefore, it's, it's something that we do intuitively. And so we have an idea of, of how it looks. Uh, you look at the, at the face of a watch and you know what time it is. It's, it's something totally close to you. And um, even, even our inner watch, you know, looks the same, I would say. So if you look at, <laughs> if you look at the, a, a different time indication, the fascinating thing is that it's a surrealism. In the first moment, you, you're confused. You, don't, you can't even read the time, even though it's a simple thing in uh, the principle that we are using. So if, if you change this, you... you uh, you, of course, have people who have to look uh, at the thing twice and you have to explain maybe. And then very important that that's the case with our indication here is that you understand it. Uh, it's not something where you have to calculate. It's something uh, that you understand immediately. It just works slightly different. So that already is fascinating. Then um, if you have time indicated in this way, in particular way that we do it, uh, you have you are forced to be more in the present moment. It's kind of like a Buddhistic way of uh, of uh, looking at time. You have the, the the hours actually that are not indicating, that are not now important. They are stored away. They are somehow doing their thing, their spin. And the hour that is important is indicating the minutes. So the other hours you don't need to focus on. You know there is a next hour coming and uh, that is in an order normally uh, in normal times, but uh, uh, it, it is, it is uh, slightly different and that uh, enabled us to do many things. It's a different perception, uh, but also it allowed us to, to design or allowed me to design the watch differently because uh, you have the indication just on one edge of the case. So you can already from that moment on, you can start to rethink not only the perception of time, but also the way, the way it looks. I always think of an Uruk as uh, the perfect watch for a, a Zen Buddhist because- uh, Absolutely. <laughs> that, you know, you shouldn't spend your time living in the past or in the future, but in the moment. And, and it kind of promotes that. Um, what, so one thing that I love, and maybe some of we can pull up a picture of the, uh, the UR100, uh, is how you also include these small um, indications that I find very uh, interesting and very, they make me smile. <clears throat> so one of the indication, the indication that I like on the UR100 is this indication that gives you um, on a fixed spot on the equator, the distance of rotation or revolution of the planet as it goes around the sun, right? And I believe it's something like within a 20 minute interval, it's like 3,000 or 35,742 kilometers or something like, something like this. Exactly, right? way right. good, 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 good homework. <laughs> but I love that because, you know, again, you've got, again, 60 minutes and each of those um, hour indicators is there's, you know, three of them and they're moving at these 20 minute intervals. And so to, to put that on there and to see that it, it's cool because it, remi it reminds you that we're living on this planet and the mm -hmm. planet is so much bigger than us and we're so small. And sometimes we get so stressed out um, about these things. Um, but, you know, in some ways it, it kind of really puts it in perspective for me. It makes me kind of feel a lot more calm because mm -hmm. the, the world is so much more vast. You see the, the rotation indications on the side of the watch. I love those because I guess then you've got these, what would normally be the minute hands 
um, that would be the dragging minute hands that go across from zero to 60. Um, then you've got them each on either side where you can see the distance that you're traveling within 35,742 kilometers during that period. As you are, if, well, I'm on the equator because I'm in Singapore, so it's the exact correct reference. For you, it's perfect, that's right. <laughs> absolutely perfect. As I stay in a fixed spot and this, and this spot rotates around uh, the planet. So it's so cool because it reminds you of, of something bigger, you know, and, and it makes you call, we call it. Time. We call it space time way. It's, it's yeah. space time, you know, <laughs> it's, this is exactly the, the, how we give the, the nickname to that piece, you know, and yes. what is quite incredible is that these two indications, so the equator in the uh, speed and uh, the, the speed around uh, traveling around the sun, the, the, there are, these are only two space movements, but actually we have uh, six or seven or even more space movements going on all the time. While we are having this interview, we are traveling through space like hell, and and that that gives you that gives you another perspective. And it, it, as I said before, it, it forces you a bit to or to understand a, a bigger picture than you are you are you have in your uh, apart, apartment or in your community or in your little business you know it's uh, for me it's what the astronauts did for us you know i mean it, i grew up in the in the times i was a child when the when the those uh, uh, moon flights were you know in fashion and when the astronauts went went on their trips to the moon uh, and so, so uh, you know, uh, this is some, my father is a physicist, so he's he's uh, he was always very interested and even worked together with uh, with uh, a few of those uh, uh, scientists and engineers there uh, who did the, who did the lunar landing model. So it was for me it was always uh, very important uh, the space space travel and you know the the whole Apollo program and all. And, uh, you know, the moment when the astronaut is in space and he, he has the earth behind his thumb, he can cover the earth, you know, with his thumb. You're so far away from, from, from earth that you can hide all the trouble that it is, that it means behind your thumb. It's a, a special uh, a situation. And we, we, we didn't really maybe pay attention that much uh, to it because you know even after the the second or third time uh, you know the third uh, space uh, trip to the moon uh, it became uh, a bit boring for most people and it needed the Apollo 13 to somehow spike it up again but right. what i'm saying is this this moment that you can look back you know towards our planet this is a, a, a kind of like a, a, a thing that they did for us they they allowed us this perspective and especially in our times, it's important to, to, to be able to, to look back and see our, our planet and see maybe also the, the trouble, see the problems from, as Felix said, from a, from a, big, a bigger picture, you know, from, from up above. And these uh, astronomical indications, normally, they, they, they were always meant that, you know, because watchmaking and astronomy, science, they're close together. It's the same, basically. And maybe you got forgotten a bit. And, and you need to do this, as you said, in a funny way um, where you can uh, transport somebody by looking at an indication into space, into outer space. Uh, when you look at the moon, uh, you know, uh, phase or so, it's also doing that. Every watch is basically a model for the universe and for the situation we are finding ourselves in. But uh, you need to do it in a, in a yet in a different way uh, that that maybe people do this trip, this tr uh, trip to outer space, where they where they look back, you know. And so uh, space time, every every motion needs time, and the other way around. So this is something uh, that is very simple but beautiful at the same time. And uh, if you can just use the hands that are not in not needed for indicating the time, they are somehow hi hiding behind this sh this cover that we have with the hundred. Um, you can transform the hand and give it a new job while it's not doing the, the job of indicating the time. So our specific indication allows us to do that in this way. And so it was uh, obvious to do it. Amazing. But it had also to do with the, with the, with the clock that Felix got from, from his father at some point as a press. And Felix, maybe you can tell us a bit about that, the Sando clock. Yes, the Gustav Sando clock, actually the, the third Royal Marine clockmaker of uh, the, the French crown. Um, uh, 
but this information actually my father got only later when he discovered this clock showing not the minutes, the hours and the seconds, actually showing the kilometers, uh, 10, 140,000 uh, kilometers per day in 24 hours. And that was a clock uh, made for um, actually by the professor of the, of the watchmaking school of, of Le Loc, Le, Gustav Sondos, uh, 1892. It was then exposed in the Swiss Pavilion um, in Chicago, in the World Fair in, in 1893. It was a Chicago, a very important uh, Chicago World Fair where in parallel Nikolai Tesla also exposed a lot of his inventions. So that was a, um, a, a very of important time. moment. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this, this is for sure, all our ideas and our ping pong between Martin and myself are, um, are related on history, on what I discover in, in history, in, in clock making, in watch making, but also in our uh, daily interest and, uh, and, and law for art, its aesthetics, uh, culture, science, music, uh, movies, and everything comes into, into our work. And I think before us, uh, it, it for me somehow it was missed in the watches I've I've learned in the 80s and 90s and uh, uh, when I grew up as a young watchmaker coming out of the watchmaking school for me um, it was not so interesting to do another tourbillon or another perpetual calendar it's, it was ju just more to explore and to look for new values and new approaches and um, I'm really uh, uh, yeah happy to 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 be on my journey with Martin the, over the last 20 years. And we are, we are only in the beginning way. We are only in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so on the subject of culture, let's talk a little bit about um, Time Eon and Naissance du Montre 2. So I believe the first Naissance du Montre project uh, was with a gentleman, gentleman amusingly named Michel Boulanger. Uh, mm -hmm. And he, um, he went to go study with uh, Philippe Dufour and with Robert Grubel and Stephen Forsey because he had wanted to make um, this, this watch using, well, I guess the whole, the whole ethos of the project is that you, the watch is to be made in traditional techniques. Um, so I guess it's wonderful because we live now in an era of industrialization, of computer numeric control. Um, and I think that to keep the culture of traditional watchmaking alive, is, is really cool. And I guess that's what the, the whole idea behind this project is. So can you tell me, how did you guys get involved? Yes, absolutely, Way It's, it's um, um, very important that uh, hand-making, artisanal watchmaking, manual machines uh, still are in, in, in action. Actually, when we started in the very beginning, over 22 years ago, all our modules, all, all our watch cases, the satellites, the dials, everything was done by manual machines. Uh, why? Because the, these were the only machines I had available at the time and I, I learned during my, my, my education. So, so that gave me the first possibility to express and to, do, to, to re realize my dreams. So um, I think it's just the, the fundament of, of watchmaking is, is artisanal handcraft ship. And this is something we, 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 we did in the very beginning and we do until today. But for sure, when we developed further our work, we were able also to combine our craftsmanship, artisanal craftsmanship into very modern techniques like Liga technique, laser techniques, new materials, so with our work, we decided to go for the extreme of what is possible to do today with the, with the machines, with the possibilities, but always, for sure, we never lost the manual touch on it. So as, as you know me, Wei, I like extremes. And with, with our work, we go for the super contemporary um, approach of, of doing our, our timekeepers. But um, Dominic Boozer, um, he is um, um, with us since many years now, like 14 years. Actually, he was helping me to constructing the Opus 5. 
wow. uh, 15, 15 years ago. So he was really the main, the, he finalized the construction of Opus 5 actually <clears throat> on his computer. And um, he approached me 10 years ago and he wanted absolutely to, um, to do a, a watch 100% with manual machines, just no compromise, no. So everything what is possible to do with manual machines and with his hands. And um, a few years later, so he, he was talking to me about this idea and I, I liked it because this is how I started in the beginning. And then I met Robert. He was talking to me of a similar concept, of a similar idea of a foundation. And then I found out about uh, Michel Boulanger and uh, for sure Philippe Dufour, which is my friend, uh, talking about their work in Time I Own together with Robert and Stephen. And um, I said, but actually, Robert, you know, this is, is it's quite interesting that you also went this way of promoting and, and give value into artisanal manual machining. Uh, because, because me and Dominic, we also had this idea. And so finally, Robert actually invited me to join into the Time Ion Foundation and to express somehow and to, 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 to come together with Gruppel Forcey or Stephen and Forcey, uh, Stephen, Stephen and Robert, I, wa I wanted to say, and, and uh, Martin and myself to, to come together and to think about uh, uh, an interesting concept which we could then produce actually with Dominic and Cyrano. Dominic and Cyrano are our engineers and also they run a prototype atelier for our work. That's cool. So um, they, they just finished now the AMC clock, atomic clock uh, with the sympathetic uh, uh, complication of, 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 the, of the movement for the watch. So we just delivered the second piece. Now, this, is, this was something we, we had to do, finally to join, to do together. Um, cool. It actually goes back to, um, to uh, uh, a discussion we had with Michael Tay at some point right. um, about giving, you know, um, or coming up with a manifesto of uh, contemporary watchmaking. And uh, one part, of course, of it uh, is that you have to value the, the, you know, the skills or the, the, the foundations of watchmaking, um, even though you're using now contemporary machines, computers uh, and uh, CNC machines and so on, but the, the, the mindset has to be of, a, of, an, of an engineer, of a, of a mechanic or of a, uh, a watchmaker. And so also the, the skills learned. If you, if you use uh, tools, you can use simple tools or more uh, sophisticated tools or more contemporary tools, computers, whatever. Uh, but your mindset has to be right and you have to be trained uh, you know, from scratch. And so with all our watchmakers, uh, it's like that. And in art, on the other hand, it's also like this. We, we are uh, in art also in a, in a um, discipline where you have um, creators, but they still actually use very old techniques. So you can use the oldest techniques, creating with, with stone, with, with, with wood, so on. But uh, you, you, of course, need to be busy with the things that, have, that are happening now. You want to express yourself about what's taking place. So you, so you have to deal with the future, with the present, and also with, uh, with the history. Uh, so, so for us, it is, of course, extremely essential and vital that, uh, that we don't forget about this, this, the roots. And uh, so talking about this with Michael Tay, uh, we wrote the manifesto. We never actually... Uh, wrote it down and, and somehow found the people to join in. But uh, later on, we, we, we learned about this time Aeon uh, uh, guys, and we saw a chance to somehow, with their you know, uh, message, uh, to align ourselves with their message of uh, paying respect to those traditions and to help them to support uh, these, because that's uh, also our, our goals. And 
that's that's like the the, the base the base of of, of this uh, collaboration that's really cool you know I, I, it's even though i've known you guys now for 15 years i never realized that and i guess i should have thought about it that that even though you make a very contemporary looking watch um, it, you are trained as a traditional watchmaker. And I know, Martin, you've got a lot of respect for that, those skills as well. And oh, the, that traditional uh, training and the capacity to use traditional manual tools gave you the possibility to have the birth of Uber because you were using those tools to create all the initial um, parts for your watches. That's really cool. Can you tell me a little bit, and maybe some of we can pull up a picture of the watch in question. Um, what, whose idea was this uh, complication to have um, this uh, constant force mechanism with a differential and then this kind of very interesting looking balance on the front of the watch? So it, it, absolutely a way. This is a, an idea which uh, came clearly from Dominique. This is his dream of a mechanical movement he, he wanted to do for himself. Um, it, it's never done before in, in uh, watchmaking actually that you have constant force produced by two barrels so wine, one is winding the other barrel and this creates a constant force through the whole uh, movement the whole gearing uh, usually uh, constant force is only for the last two or three wheels of a, of a, of a whole movement but here in this construction the constant force comes from the beginning on, from the barrel on. And this is, is unique. It was never done in, in watchmaking because you have to create very special uh, springs. And uh, uh, it's something which takes a lot of research, actually. We made with a German company to, to create these, sp these springs. It's his dream. And we thought that would be perfect to show that in... Uh, in that unique piece we, we, we are here now creating for time ion so when you look to this watch actually you see the movement idea the concept the construction is coming from dominic uh, the architecture of the movement actually the aesthetic of the movement and the finishing control comes from uh, robert and uh, stephen mm -hmm. And, and, and the aesthetic is influenced uh, by, by Martin. So it's all of us are in the boat here. And uh, that's, that's great. And the execution of the movement is done by Dominic and Cyrano. So they have in their atelier all manual machines they need to do uh, the wheels, uh, the pinions, uh, the barrels, the balance wheel, even the anchor, uh, the escapement wheel. Oh. Um, so this is all done uh, at Dominic's and Cyrano's place. Um, the platin, les ponts, the, 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 the bridges, and the basic plate actually is done by Grebel Forsey. Wow. I uh, love it. And I also love the fact that it's really good looking as well. Well, for the case, it was, uh, it was as always, with collaborations. If you do uh, collaborations also... Um, connected or for, for the design, it, it, it is not uh, that easy because you have to somehow uh, join forces there as well. And so it was, uh, it was an interesting process to, to do that together with, uh, uh, with Grip of Forsey. Um, so we had like, they like interpreted uh, Urwerk. And then after that, I used Urwerk to, to, to correct and <laughs> So it was kind of like a, a back and forth in this sense, which is interesting. Our main goal, and that's what I uh, then, when I talked with Robert about this, we agreed that we should create a, a case that is that looks contemporary, but is handmade. So uh, somehow to, to astonish people, what, that can be made hand by hand? Is that, uh, is that possible? The, the watch looks uh, you know, from, 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 from today um, quite complex, but it is in fact uh, all handmade, and uh, so so this this was actually the, the little trick there. Uh, so you see codes of the Ulrich watches and codes of the Gerber Force uh, um, uh, world uh, fused together, which is which is an interesting thing. You have it also on the back side where you see Gerber Force and Ulrich. It's always kind of cool that uh, you know you have two brands, two brand names uh, together on a product on a on a watch. Uh, I I always I liked that that thought uh, 
from the beginning that you that you can have like two brands uh, somehow fused together. Yeah, I love the collaborations you've done, and in, the, in particular, the one you did with uh, David Bim was amazing. Yeah, that was also great, uh, actually, great uh, collaboration. Great but you know, way in 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 times like uh, this crazy Corona serialistic uh, times, uh, we we were thinking that we, we hold back with our novelties, uh, over novelties, and we we rather show um, an interesting um, collaboration with, with uh, Global Force on Time Eon, which is somehow done for for the for research and to keep to keep the values also of, of watchmaking. And uh, I think this is in, in special times like now uh, very important. Felix, would you, would you mind telling me a little bit more about the, how the constant force works? You're saying it's, um, you mentioned it's constant force is being, is coming from the barrels. Um, is it, the, is the differential there to average the, the two barrels or, or what is, like how exactly does it work if you don't mind my asking? Yeah, yeah. so it's called, the, 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 the real term of that mechanism is tensator. And a tensator uh, function uh, of, of two barrels um, so, um, the thing is, way <laughs> in the last year, I tried it out many times to explain that mechanical functioning of these two barrels together, but it never comes through. You really have to to see it on the technical drawing. So I'm I'm sorry on 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 that. Um, it's it's really that one. Uh, the barrel actually, the, 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 there is one spring which is folding from one barrel to the other, and oh. this movement uh, creates uh, um, a constant force. But the thing is, in just talking about it, you will never get it. And I think this is all about it. <laughs> That's cool. That's great, and it's cool that you have two guys who have really spent. I mean, because they've they've both been in that uh, work for quite some time. I know you mentioned Dominic have been with you um, since uh, Opus 5, but Cyrano has been around for some time as well, hasn't he? And, and they kind of reconnected because they knew each other in watchmaking school and they reconnected at Uvork, is that correct? Yes, and uh, actually we, we, all the three of us, we, we were very good friends during the watchmaking school in Solothurn. So we met all there, actually also um, my, my friends working in Zurich, Roland and Martin, uh, in, in Zurich, uh, working on, on the CNC machines and finishing machines and, and uh, really producing all the parts. So we are uh, actually five or six old friends from the watchmaking school in Solothurn. Um, good friends of mine where I can trust and where I can come make true all our <clears throat> crazy ideas of, of myself and Martin, you know, and it's... it's uh, it's incredible to have to have this family together for that long time. It's really it's we are really blessed to to have a very stable uh, family uh, working together. You know, it reminds me from time to time when I see another uh, Woody Allen movie. I, I see always in the in the scripts uh, all the time the same the same uh, the same people working in, in backstage of Woody Allen. So. Uh, or, or I lately saw also the, the James Bond movies, and there is also always the same family, the Broccoli family doing the, 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 all the different stuff, you know. So it's it, it's it's very beautiful to have to have to, to have that. Amazing. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you for also cheering us up and uplifting our spirits with this beautiful project that you're doing. Uh, and I hope to meet with you guys and share a fondue with you guys on a rooftop or someplace on this planet once uh, everything is uh, cured. Yeah, we Cheers. have to think about the perfect place to, to do a, you know, a gathering, you know, absolutely. Smoke a cigar and drink something good. Thank you okay. very much, Wei. Uh,